All right, hi everyone, and welcome to Cassandra Lunch number 74. Uh, today we have a special guest speaker, Peter Corliss, uh, going to be presenting Scylla DB. He is the technical, or Scylla, the pronunciation, I uh, believe is Scylla. Um, he is the technical marketing manager over there at Scylla. And the organizers for this event are Raul Singh, Arpan Patel, and myself. We are always looking for new speakers, members, and sponsors. So if you or someone you know uh, would benefit from learning in this, or even uh, someone you know who would love like to present and kind of put themselves out here or sponsor an event like this, definitely reach out to one of us. Our emails are listed below there. And we are a part of a larger community. Data Community DC is a diverse and inclusive culture. So we support everyone. Um, Regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, everyone's welcome here. And we expect respect to be given to those classes. And you can find out more about Data Community DC at their blog, as well as upcoming events. And what we cover here is everything related to Cassandra. So this includes the surrounding um, ecosystem, um, including also data stacks, uh, Scylla, as you as we're as is uh, getting presented today, um, Spark, Kafka, so things that connect to Cassandra as well. And at this point in the introduction, if anyone is new and would like to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you do with data, um, feel free to do so. Do see some new faces in there. So would like to hear from some of you guys if you're if you're feeling uh, brave this morning. All right, well, we can move on. Um, group roles, if you have a question, uh, ask it, be polite and courteous to others and share what you know. Um, this is meant to be a bit of a discussion. Uh, however, Peter, we can have you go over kind of how you would like questions to be asked once you take over. And here to not, we deal with real-time data platforms um, and we work with Cassandra quite a bit. So interested to learn. Um, about Scylla and how it how it kind of differs, and um, also looking forward to hearing how it's actually pronounced from <laughs> from the leader there and Peter. Um, DataStax is a partner as well, um, along with George Washington University. Um, some of the other program sponsors are listed here, as well as organizational sponsors. And 15 second announcements. If anyone has any jobs, meetups, hackathons coming up that they would like to promote, you can use this as an opportunity to do so. I think I think Scylla is having a summit coming up sometime soon, right, Peter? You guys, you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah. So uh, the call for speakers for Scylla Summit 2022 is currently open, and uh, uh, we would love to have people from uh, across the industry uh, submit talks to us. So you can find out more about on our website. And I do have some other announcements uh, later on that I'll have in my presentation. The one last thing I want to say is we certainly have job openings, so you can check out the careers page on our website as well, SillaDB.com. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, does anyone else have any um, anything coming up? And thank you. Now I can confirm it is Scylla, <laughs> not Scylla. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, one of our own announcements, Anant is hiring for full or part-time positions as well. Data platform operators, architects, and engineers. You can learn more and connect with us at careers.anant.us. And some upcoming Cassandra events. Um, we'll be having Getting Started with Data Stacks or DSE on Docker. Um, and then we also have uh, Aaron Plowitz from Data Stacks. Uh, he's going to be speaking on tombstone mitigation strategies. All of our events are listed in not.us slash events. And we do have the sister lunch to this every Monday, Data Engineers Lunch, same time, uh, different Zoom link. Um, but you can get that from our events page. And all of these videos are uploaded to our YouTube. So if you're, and we're live on YouTube now, so if you're watching on YouTube, definitely like and subscribe. Um, <clears throat> definitely check out the playlist for this meetup as well as the Data Engineers Lunch meetup. We've covered a lot of topics. This is, as mentioned, the 74th, I believe. So 
Um, we've covered a lot of different things about Cassandra. So if you're looking to learn more, definitely check out those playlists. Quite frequently, demos involved in hands-on kind of kind of talks. Uh, Cassandra link should be your number one resource for Cassandra related articles as well. Uh, this stuff is hand curated by Raul. You can see it covers everything from Cassandra to Spark Kafka. Um, so if you're looking to learn more or maybe there's a particular question you have, uh, highly, highly recommend checking out Cassandra link in order to get and, those questions answered. And, and Scylla. There's definitely a lot of Scylla resources there too. So, and we'll add more. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, definitely don't want to forget that. All right, and that's it for the introduction. I will hand it over to Peter. All right, let me see if I can uh, get my slides uh, presented correctly. I just want to make sure I get into presenter view and uh, I can have my notes up and then you can see the rest of the slides. Let's see if this is going to work here. Do, do, do. All right, how does that look? You can see my slides and my, not my notes? Yep. Okay. yep. Fantastic, okay, so let's get into this here. All right, hello to everyone attending the Cassandra Lunch today. I wanna to take the time to thank our hosts, Anand Corporation. You'll be able to find this and other great talks about NoSQL and distributed databases in their GitHub repository. My name is Peter Corliss. I am the Director of Technical Advocacy at SillaDB. Uh, I listen to our users' stories and discover wisdom in each uh, to share with our other practitioners in the industry at large, whether through blogs or in technical presentations. Today, we're going to compare Apache Cassandra against Scylla using some objective observable analysis from software release cycles to GitHub commits. Also, I want to come here today to shatter an illusion, that of the drop-in replacement. Yes, I know that we at SillaDB have ourselves often said that we're just that, but I wanna point out that while there are many similarities, there are also many points of departure in design, in implementation, and in capabilities. Lastly, I wanted to share with you some benchmarking results from tests we conducted, both Cassandra 3.11 against its own successor, Cassandra 4.0, as well as against Scylla Open Source 4.4. So let's get right into it. Uh, we talked about Cassandra 4.0 first in 2019 and in 2020. By then it had reached beta where it would linger for another calendar year. It even missed the deadline just as excited and relieved as anyone in the industry when I heard it was really finally here in July of 2021. But that was four long years between the last minor release and this major release, a long time in uh, database years. So I'm glad to note that the first Cassandra 4X maintenance release also came out in September, uh, which means that they're establishing a new cadence for software release, Cassandra 4.0.1. And let me show you why that's important. Here, you can see the calendar of milestone releases uh, as of the time when we conducted our benchmarks of Cassandra 4.0 this past August. You can just see that glaring multi-year chasm between the release of Cassandra 3.11 and Cassandra 4.0. If you go back earlier to the last major release of Cassandra 3.0, you can see that it was back in 2015. That was around the same time that Scylla Open Source uh, opened its GitHub repository. Uh, I think we're on 0.1.0 around then. So over this same historical span of time, Scylla was birthed into the world and has had four major releases. And within those major releases, multiple minor releases, as well as dozens and dozens of maintenance releases. Now, the reason why these cadences matter is because it shows the velocity of your software supply chain. It shows how quickly you can innovate. It shows how quickly you can close critical bugs. It was one of the main reasons that some companies like Expedia felt that they could trust Scylla more than Cassandra, uh, simply because it was on a dependable regular release cadence. Also, on top of our Scylla open source releases, we have an annual cadence of enterprise releases with additional testing, with additional features, with additional customer expectations for stability. Uh, in most cases, our users will see new features and capabilities in early deployment in Scylla open source first. Then as they mature and harden, we'll move them to general deployment or GD status. And only then will you see them sink down into an enterprise release vehicle. Uh, there are also some special enterprise only features, which I won't get into today, but just know that we're running these two trains side by side. 
Uh, users see the velocity development in the number of commits per week. Uh, sometimes Scylla exceeds 100 a week. Um, you might also be surprised to discover that across 2021, there were about 50% more people committing to Scylla open source than to Apache Cassandra. Uh, in terms of the major and minor releases made between 2018 and today, Apache Cassandra 4.0 is the only major release that they have had across this period of time. Whereas the Scylla team pumped out a baker's dozen of freshly baked releases. Um, it's also surprising to some people to know that we have more GitHub stars than Cassandra now, and the gap between the two is widening. Uh, there are a lot of Scylla curious people out there, and we'd love to get them to set up a cluster. Historically, since Scylla released, we have had been perceived as chasing Cassandra, working to achieve feature parity. So this meant that through 2020, we were playing catch up. Uh, however, with Scylla Open Source 4.4, we went beyond feature completeness. We suddenly had features that Cassandra didn't have at all. Plus we had features that might have had a similar name, but we had implemented differently, often radically so. Uh, and lastly, they keep adding commands and features and formats in Cassandra. For example, the SS tables formats change once between the 4.0 beta and release Canada one, and then again in the final 4.0 release. What this results in is the following kind of buckets of features. Some core features of Cassandra, which Scylla has also implemented in its core, the same same. The same configuration, the same command line inputs and outputs, the same wire protocol, and so on. Then there are some things that are unique to Cassandra. For instance, the Cassandra 4.0 features. Some of these we plan to add in due time. Some simply may not be appropriate to implement because of the very different infrastructure and design philosophies, even the code bases. For instance, you won't find Java specific features like you would have in Cassandra. Inversely, you'll find some features in Scylla that they just won't implement in Cassandra. These are points of divergence, which could become showstoppers for migration um, if you depended on them in your use case. Or they might be specific reasons to migrate if they represent features or capabilities that the other database just will never offer you and you really need them. Uh, lastly, there's a mix of features that may be called by the same name or may sound quite similar, but are actually implemented uniquely across Cassandra and Scylla. So while Scylla began as chasing Cassandra, now many of our features are beyond Cassandra. And while we remain committed to making our database as feature complete and compliant to Cassandra as possible and pragmatic, it will be quite interesting to watch as current points of departure between the two become either narrowed or widened over the coming years. So let's start with the common ground. If you're familiar with Cassandra today, what can you expect to feel as comfortable and as natural in Scylla? Uh, first, a common ancestry. Many of the principles between Cassandra and Scylla are directly correlated. Uh, in many ways, you can call Cassandra the mother of Scylla and our little database mythological family tree here. We also pull in some of our DNA from Amazon DynamoDB. Ah, home sweet home, the concepts and key spaces and tables, pretty much standard CQL here. Uh, basic CRUD operations as well, all quite familiar, comfortable as a favorite sweater. And the high availability architecture that Cassandra is known for is likewise found in Scylla. Peer-to-peer -peer leaderless topology, replication factors and consistency levels set per request, uh, and multi-data center replication, which allows you to be survivable uh, uh, even if they have a full data center loss. All of this is typical AP mode database um, behavior. And lastly, you have the underlying ring architecture, the key key value scheme of a wide column database, partition keys, clustering keys, nodes, vnodes, automatic sharding, and the murmur three partitioner, all same, same. And while there are still more features that are like, let's not be exhaustive, uh, and I'll move on to what seems similar between the two, but are really just not the same. CQL, that's right, Cassandra query language implementation itself. Uh, while most of the basic commands are the same, you will note that Scylla may have implemented C CQL commands that do not appear in Cassandra or vice versa. There's also a version level completeness. For example, Cassandra's CQL is now up to 3.4.5, while Scylla's implementation is only at 3.4.0. What are the specific differences between them? I'll let you scour the documents as a homework assignment. Uh, while some of what you find may seem pretty trivial, um, uh, if you are migrating between the two, 
any unexpected discoveries might represent unpleasant showstoppers until we finally reach CQL parity and completeness again. Next, SS tables. Uh, Scylla is compatible with Cassandra 3.11's latest MD format, but did you spot the differences in Cassandra 4.0? In the first release, Canada, they snuck out the NA format, which added a bunch of small changes. And then when 4.0 itself shipped, they added a new way to store the original host ID in NB format SS table files. Uh, so we've opened up a GitHub issue to make sure Scylla will have the NA and NB format compatibility in due time, uh, number 8593, if you want to track it on GitHub. But this is the sort of common everyday feature chasing you have to have whenever there are new releases of anything, whenever anything is spun and everything else needs to ensure compatibility. There's always those, that little lag and that gap time before implementation. Lightweight transactions or LWTs are pretty much the same sort of thing on both systems to do compare and set or conditional updates. But on Scylla, there are, they are simply more performant because instead of four round trips, uh, as with Cassandra, we only require three. What this has led to in practice is that some folks who tried LWT only backed them out in Cassandra when performance tanked or didn't meet their expectations. So if you experimented with LWTs in Cassandra, you might want to try them again with Scylla. Materialized views or MVs are another case where Scylla put more polish into the apple. Um, while Cassandra has had materialized views since 2017, they've been problematic since first introduced. At the Distributed Data Summit 2018, Cassandra PMC Chair Nate McCall told the audience that if you have them, take them out. And I remember sitting uh, in the audience absorbing the varied reactions as Nate spoke frankly and honestly about the shortcomings of the implementation. Uh, was there a comment? Nope. Sorry, okay. my mistake. No problem. Uh, meanwhile, the following year, uh, Scylla introduced its own implementation of materialized views. Uh, they served as the foundation for other features such as secondary indexes. While MVs can still get out of sync from the base table, it is not as likely or easy to do. Uh, Scylla DB engineers have poured a lot of effort over the past few years to get materialized views right, and uh, we consider the feature ready for production. Uh, speaking of secondary indexes, while you have them in Cassandra, they are only local secondary indexes, limited to the same base partition. They are efficient, but they won't scale. The global secondary indexes, which are only present in Scylla, uh, allow you to index across your entire data set, but they can be more complicated and they can lead to unpredictable performance. So you want to be more judicious on how and where you implement them. Uh, the good news is that Scylla supports both global and local secondary indexes, and you can apply both to a column, uh, so you can run your queries as narrow or as broad as you wish. Change data capture, uh, CDC, is the most a dramatic difference between Cassandra and Scylla. Cassandra implements CDC as a commit log-like structure. Uh, each node gets a CDC log, and then when you want to query them, uh, you have to take these structures off box, combine them, and dedupe them. Now, if I misunderstood that, um, please follow up with me afterwards. I'd love to hear about um, from Cassandra practitioners on how you're using CDC. <coughs> um, but think about the design decisions that went into Scylla CDC implementation. First, it uses a CDC table that resides on the same node as the base table, uh, shadowing any changes in those partitions. And those CDC tables are then queryable using standard CQL. So the result is uh, you're already going to be uh, getting deduped data. Uh, there's no log merges necessary. You get a stream of data, whether that includes the diffs, the pre-image, the post-image, whatever, uh, however you want to consume it. We also have a TTL uh, set on the uh, CDC table, so they won't grow unbounded over time. And so this made it very easy for us to make a Kafka CDC source uh, connector based on Debezium. Uh, it simply consumes the data from the CDC tables using CQL, and it pumps it out to Kafka topics. No muss, no fuss. Uh, and here's another example of a point of departure. Cassandra historically had problems with streaming SS tables. Um, this can be important when you're going to do topology changes, and you need to bring up or down nodes and rebalance your cluster. Zero copy streaming means that you can take a whole SS table, all of its partitions, and copy it over to another node without breaking the SS table into objects which then creates unnecessary garbage that then needs to be collected. Um, it also avoids bringing uh, data into user space uh, on the transmitting and the receiving nodes. So ideally this was to get you closer to hardware IOs uh, bounds. 
Scylla instead uh, already had dramatically changed how it was going to do internode copying. We use what we call row level repair instead as a standard streaming methodology, um, uh, instead of a standard streaming methodology like RPC. Uh, it was more robust. It allowed midpoint stops and restarts of transfers. It was more granular, meant that you only need to send the needed rows instead of the entire table. And it was more efficient overall. So these are fundamentally different ways to solve uh, us the same problem. And I'll show you the results of these different approaches when I get to the benchmark section. <clears throat> Netty async messaging is a good thing. Any way to avoid blocking and bottlenecking operations is awesome. Uh, also, the way it does thread pools meant that you weren't setting a fixed number of threads per peer, uh, which could mismatch actual real world requirements. So Scylla has always believed in uh, non-blocking IO. It is famous for its async everywhere C++ architecture, plus the shard for core design meant that you were minimizing intercore communications as much as possible in the first place. So again, these are good things, but for Cassandra, it was an evolutionary realization they wove into their existing design, whereas for Scylla, it was a day one design decision, which we've improved upon a lot since then. Uh, in summation, sort of doing the same thing, but in very different ways. <coughs> Kubernetes. Cassandra now has a range of options for Kubernetes from Datastack's Kate Sandra, which replaces the now deprecated CAS operator, or CAS COP from Orange to Bitnami charts. If anyone has feedback on any of these in particular, I'd encourage you to contact me after the talk. I'd love to learn from your experience. For Scylla, we have our own Scylla operator. Our users like it just swell. Uh, so yes, Kubernetes is available for both, but each operator is purpose-built for each respective database. Now let's look at the things that are just simply different from fundamental design decisions to implementation philosophies to even the vision of what these database platforms are and can do. Uh, a critical day one decision for Scylla was to build this highly distributed database upon a shared nothing shard per core architecture, the C-Star framework. Scale it up, scale it out, or both. It's a greedy system and it will gladly utilize whatever resources you grant it. Uh, Scylla is designed to take maximum utilization out of all the hardware you can throw at it. Uh, and because of this, Scylla can take advantage of any size server. A uh, hundred cores, sure. A thousand cores, don't even laugh. You know, I know of a company that's working on a 2000 core system and such hyperscale servers will be available before you know it. In comparison, uh, Cassandra uh, shards per node, not per core, but per node. It also gets relatively low utilization out of the system uh, that it's running in, and that's just the nature of a JVM. It doesn't permit you knowledge uh, or of or control over the underlying infrastructure, which is why people seek to run multi-tenant uh, sometimes in a Cassandra uh, a node uh, to utilize all those cycles that Cassandra just can't harness. Alternator, uh, that's the name for our Amazon DynamoDB compatible API. We built it into Scylla, uh, which means that you now have freedom. You can run your workloads on AWS, but you might find that you get a better TCO out of our implementation running our, on our Scylla Cloud database as a service instead. Uh, or you might be able to migrate your workload to Google Cloud or Azure, or even put it on premises. And an interesting example of that latter is AWS out Outposts. These are cages with AWS servers installed in your own uh, premises. These servers act as an on-premise extension of AWS. Uh, because we were capable of being deployed anywhere, Scylla was chosen as AWS's method to deploy your DynamoDB workloads directly into an AWS on outpost uh, environment. Um, getting back to the alternator implementation itself, using our CDC feature, as the underlying infrastructure, we also support DynamoDB streams. Plus we have a load balancer to round out the same, same expectations of existing DynamoDB users. And lastly, our Scylla Spark Migrator makes it easy to take those DynamoDB workloads and place them wherever your customers desire. And there are many, many other things I could have picked out, but I just wanna show you this one as more of a quality of life feature for the database administrators, seedless gossip. Uh, it's uh, been a lot of pain and suffering if you lost a seed node. Uh, it requires manual assignment. Uh, seed nodes just won't bootstrap themselves. It can cause a lot of real world and real time frustrations when your cluster as, is at its most temperamental. Uh, so one of our engineers came up with a brilliant idea of just getting rid of seed nodes entirely, reworking the way gossip is implemented to be more symmetric and seamless 
Um, and I have a, I hope you take the chance to read this article uh, on how it was done because I promise it's really juicy. Uh, so next, let's get down to some more hard numbers. These are benchmark results and they were published in August 21, uh, 2021, so they're very current. The first thing to note is that throughputs uh, for Cassandra between 3.11 and 4.0 aren't that much different. Uh, and in all cases, uh, they were significantly lower than what Scylla could achieve on the exact same hardware, about two to five times slower. Uh, there are some workloads for Cassandra 4.0 that saw improvements of 25% or more, all the way up to 100% improvement in a high cache hit rate uh, scenario. But for many tests, the achievable throughputs for Cassandra 4.0 over 3.11 didn't budge much at all. What did radically change for Cassandra 4.0 were the latencies. Uh, in some cases, P99 latencies dropped by 95 to 99% uh, between Cassandra 3.11 and uh, 4.0. But even then, uh, in many cases, the latencies were still just still far higher than Scylla up to 100 times worse. So sure, if you're running 3.11, uh, under many conditions, it makes sense to upgrade to Cassandra 4.0 you'll see massive latency drops and depending upon the workload, some significant performance gains. But having waited to 2021 for this release, uh, are these performance gains sufficient to warrant recommending upgrading to Cassandra 4.0? Uh, in many cases, it just makes more sense to migrate to Scylla uh, and maybe just start there for a greenfield. So let's take a look at uh, throughputs versus latencies. Uh, in this use case, you can see how Cassandra's long tail latencies went nonlinear really quickly in the 30 to 40K operations per second range. Uh, Scylla, meanwhile, continued to scale far more linearly, and it kept P99s lower than 10 milliseconds out to around 170K operations per second. So it provided four to six times the throughput on the exact same hardware. Replacing a node. Uh, I hear it actually happens uh, in production networks from time to time. Uh, here you can see that while zero copy streaming and other performance improvements in Cassandra 4.0 definitely did provide some speed improvements, uh, it's still going to be multiple times slower than Scylla performed, uh, could perform the same node replacement. So why are you waiting more than three hours uh, uh, over a day to replace a single node when you can do the same operation in less than an hour? Because while you're busy streaming, you're still down a node and your performance is suffering a low grade fever until the cluster finally rebalances. And this real time delay is even more pronounced if you need to scale a cluster by more than a single node. Say you want to double capacity. Uh, with Scylla's faster per node provisioning, you can actually double the entire cluster, the whole thing, faster than it would take Cassandra 4.0 to even get the first node up and running. But this is killer. Uh, and I want you to look at this closely. Your eyes might have missed that first blue bar in the chart. That's Scylla. Uh, Scylla optimizes compaction speed so much that it can run compactions in all of 36 minutes on a three node cluster. Boom, done. Meanwhile, Cassandra could take nearly a day even after we tuned it. By default, it took a day and a half to run compactions. So yes, with tuning, Cassandra 4.0 is moderately better than Cassandra 3.11, but why are you needlessly inflicting, inflicting pain and suffering on the DevOps team? And in this test, we decided to switch some things up. Uh, rather than run on the exact same hardware, this test ran on clusters more optimized for the respective databases. Here we chose i3 metal instances for Scylla because Scylla written in C++ can run close to that metal. Uh, whereas Cassandra, written in Java, still doesn't have full utility of the server it's running on, yeah, even with the newer JVMs. They are better, yes, but you're still walled off from truly understanding the hardware you're operating on. So in this case, we have Cassandra on i3 4x large instances, and um, we gave Cassandra 40 of those i3 metal nodes for 600, uh, uh, sorry, Cassandra had 40 of those nodes that um, 640 of vCPUs in total. Uh, Scylla was only on four i3 metals. Uh, so that's only 288 vCPUs, less than half of the Cassandra test cluster. But Scylla was able to maintain the same or better performance, uh, even being outgunned. 
uh, because we really take advantage of every CPU cycle we can get our hands on. Uh, what resulted was a 60% savings in total cost of ownership, but also that reduction of 90% of your administrative burden and attack surface. Uh, you simply have a tenth of the nodes to watch over, which makes a difference as you continue to scale. Uh, here, I provided some links to the published benchmarks you can find on our website. You can see exactly our methodology. You can conduct these benchmarks yourself just to you know, make sure that we're, we're being honest about this. Uh, you can also watch the on-demand webinar we did with the engineers who ran the benchmark. And the Q&A that followed was really engaging. Um, uh, it actually lasted a half an hour longer than we planned the webinar because people just kept on having so many questions. And I think you guys would get a lot of insight out of it. Uh, it goes into far more depth than I can cover here today. Uh, meanwhile, if you are intrigued and you want to learn more about Scylla, we have this wonderful upcoming free online Scylla University Live. It's a training event. Uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, November 9th for the Americas, and it'll be Wednesday, November 10th for Europe, Africa, and the Asia Pacific. So you can check out that link there to register. Uh, also, if you can't make that live event, we have a free self-paced uh, coursework available at Silla University uh, to add to your NoSQL expertise. We even gave you a course, we give you course completion certificate, certificates. You can post those right on LinkedIn. And with that, I'd like to open up for questions and answers and love to hear your thoughts. Wow, great, great presentation, Peter. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of new stuff. <clears throat> <laughs> I, 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 have, I, have a few, uh, I have a few questions, but I'll wait, I'll wait sure. for others. Yeah, and you can ask the questions via chat. Uh, you can uh, mic up however you prefer. Yeah, so uh, something I came across uh, researching skill in preparation for this um, that was mentioned on the website was incremental compaction. Can you speak a little about that? Sure. Incremental compaction is not an open source feature. That's enterprise. So today I was just yeah. trying to stick with the open source. But let me explain this because it's really awesome. Um, incremental compaction, if, if you're familiar with uh, Cassandra today, like you pretty much have to reserve half of your disk space for those compactions if and when you run them, right? Some people just never run compaction. But um, because it's painful, right? Uh, you leave half of your disk space utterly fallow. You can't touch it because it could be used at any time for these gigantic compaction uh, systems. Um, so what happened is that we figured a way to be able to split compaction students to a much more atomic kind of operation. And this incremental compaction is constantly, constantly compacting SS table files so that it doesn't need 50% free disk space, it only requires maybe 10 or 15%, which means that you get far greater utility out of the storage that you have in your cluster. Uh, and so like out of maybe if you have, um, you know, 100 terabytes of storage, and you only use 50, now you might be able to use 80, 85%. Uh, and in fact, the larger the storage gets, the more efficient the incremental compaction gets and the closer to that tolerance you, you can run. Um, so uh, it's a very interesting feature. And that alone has made Scylla Enterprise worth the cost of the investment because you save in just having to keep scaling out hardware. You, you, get, you, you can just run more efficiently on a smaller cluster. Oh, also, I, I know you guys have been talking about this since the, you know, since the beginning, uh, Josh and other people. Scylla, Scylla, like how do you pronounce it? Um, according to Old Greek, I think it would be more closer to Scylla. Um, or Skyla, um, uh, according to modern English, uh, it's been rendered as Scylla. But we tell people, however you pronounce it, if you're paying the bills, you can pronounce it however you like. <laughs> so don't worry yes. about it. Mm -hmm. Any next question, next question then? Yep. Um, yes, I have one that's more uh, related to, I think you mentioned it and you went to the next slide, so I didn't uh, interrupt you, but um, you know, in the JVM implementations of Cassandra, um, we commonly hit um, problems associated with large partitions. And so there's lots of different ones, but generally they, they manifest in different stages of the, of the, of the Cassandra lifecycle. Yes. Um, so just wondering, you know, what are the, What's the 
what's the world like for large partitions in, in, in Scylla? Yeah, so what's really interesting, and I didn't get into this today at all, but we have a Scylla monitoring stack, and it's based upon Grafana and Prometheus. Um, and we also have some tooling built into the system itself. Like you need to be able to spot hot partitions or large partitions, top partitions, right? So we actually have some tooling built into the system to look for those kind of hot spots. Because you're right. I mean, uh, uh, a schema that you might have built a year or two years ago, suddenly you're finding that the way it's designed now, the use uh, patterns that you have on it uh, forces things to become hot or like you have that one hot product that suddenly everybody's hitting that, you know, the uh, proverbial uh, dress that broke the internet, right? Um, so yes, we, we definitely have methods to watch for those kinds of things. Scylla generally performs better with uh, hot partitions and Ziphian distributions of like, you know, a lot of traffic going to a particular node. Um, we, we tend to perform better uh, on this than uh, Cassandra, and we actually have done some studies about that in the past. Um, but, I, you know, we haven't updated them for the Cassandra 4.0 issue. But the, you will find, uh, again, a lot of good stuff when you take a look at um, the advisor section of still a monitoring stack. It'll actually watch for these kinds of things and know like mm, you might want to check this this is this is a yellow light on your dashboard it's not a red light it's not like the system's down but this is a yellow light i'm just going to suggest you take a look at top partitions for instance gotcha so if i if i understand correctly Scylla doesn't magically make your bad data model amazing <laughs> no if you decided to uh divide your data uh if your partition scheme was by gender uh you get what you deserve right <laughs> um got it got it what what uh i uh, the next question again it's, it's related it re is related to that um and you know there is a t there is a memory limit that basically uh, causes failures when when we have large partitions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, in and then then that's that memory limit is also related to the the JVM. Uh, even if you use off heap memory, there's another limit. So so yeah. obviously you guys can handle it better. So what is the, yeah? Because you're the not going to upper, upper limit. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, we're just not going to have you dinking with off heap memory. Like there's none of that. There's right. just it, You right. just get none of that. Right. So you don't even have to worry about it. Traditionally, the way things happen is and I didn't even get into things like read path and write path or anything like that. But just imagine that on the read path, you have to have a lot of memory dedicated to your mem tables. Right. Before they get flush, you, you know, depending upon uh, how often you're getting, you know, whether you're read, write heavy, whatever it is. But let's presume this is a mixed workload. You're going to have a lot of stuff that's going to be uh, stored up in mem tables. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a good chunk of the memory uh, is going to just be for mem table access. Uh, and mm -hmm. then for the uh, read path, you're also going to have a huge chunk of memory um, used for our, uh, our, our row based partition. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a row based cache. So we don't maintain the multiple levels of caches that you have in Cassandra. Um, mm -hmm. We only use a single common row based cache. Um, but again, that's also going to be like a huge chunk of memory. And we have ways, for instance, though, that you can do a bypass cache operation. And you know, like, let's say a full table scan, the cache is actually going to be an anti-pattern for that, right? So you want to just do a bypass cache if you're doing a full table scan. Um, so, but yeah, that's going to be the, the two top memory um, things that you have. Um, but I don't think we're going to have the same kind of memory bounding um, issues that you have with, let's say, a Redis, like because we're not trying to keep everything in memory, or even yep. like Aerospike tries to keep all indexes in memory, right? So we're just trying to keep a a, a good uh, cache, and then again, the mem table that's just going to be you know flushed uh, as quickly as possible, you know, depending upon uh, how quickly it's filling up. Got it. Is is that good? Yep. I, I guess to, to get the uh, the answer, I'm gonna have to make a really bad partition to see how, how what's the upper limit. Uh, I, I I I I understand the theory, but I'm just saying like the practical limit. Um, you know, I've I've seen some like one gigabyte partitions, and I've seen sixty four gigabyte partitions. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you know, again, I think that that also gets into like. Um, 
like what do people call large, right? Because one gig is yep. a large partition. And the question is, is that a phenomenal, like one in a lifetime, one in a database kind of partition? Or is somebody literally trying to put every single, like, you know, everything is in a one gigabyte partition. Like, you know, the whole thing is chunkified that way. Um, and I think that gets into a lot of uh, how uh, people try and store their data. I think that, um, you know, and the other thing too is that we ran some tests that showed like, what if you're just using a 1K um, uh, data transfer size or a 2K or 4K or eight or one, you know, 128K. And actually the larger chunks that you get, the better your throughput uh, in overall bytes transferred, but obviously the less operations per second, right? So, so I think that, again, yep. it depends a lot upon that kind of data modeling. And there is, I mean, this is calculus. This is, there's no simple arithmetic way to answer this question, right? So, but yeah, I mean, if you got, if you, certainly you guys have the chops, you can do a lot of testing for us and you could tell us what you observe. And I would be very interested to hear uh, if you kick the tires, uh, how do you make Scylla fall over? You know, cause again, any database that you want to torture test, you'll be able to get it to fall over question is, is that an interesting and duplicatable and, you know, um, uh, and customer, um, you know, field usage kind of uh, interesting way of, yep. of getting it to fall over. Yep. Yep. No, that's great. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Uh, by the way, uh, I didn't mention this, but I did a talk recently about what I'm calling torpedo testing. And I think it's something that people might want to consider um, when designing uh, for resiliency. Um, we had a customer that had 30 nodes in a cluster and I, I went quickly through that, but they had a data center fire and they lost 10 out of the 30 nodes in a, um, in a total overall distributed cluster where they had like 10 nodes in one data center, 10 in another, 10 in a third. And so they lost a full third of their nodes, just gone, burned to the ground, you know, slag heap of ash and metal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the rest of the cluster was able to pick up the slack. Now, granted, it was early in the morning and they had a, a little bit of an over-provisioning, but they didn't lose any data and they didn't lose um, any customer traffic, right? They were able to just shunt over those requests to the other data centers. But that brought to mind an idea for a thing called, I, I call torpedo testing, which is how many nodes do you need to take out of service and uh, before the whole cluster just goes belly up and sinks to the bottom. Uh, if you just lose one node out of a cluster, like what does that do to latencies and throughput? You lose a second one, lose a third. Like for some customers, they want to know their points of resiliency and the breaking points for it. And I thought that, um, you know, that that would be a nice little kind of toolkit where we're thinking about putting together a toolkit to do that kind of test rigging you know, to see exactly what performance looks like as you degrade and debilitate a cluster. Then right. con conversely, the same kind of thing is like, so if you lose a couple of nodes, let's say you lose three nodes out of a cluster of 30, and then you start reprovisioning nodes, how long does it take to heal that cluster and get back to full capacity, you know, over time? So I think, you know, th there are some very interesting things you can do to a database beyond just Jepson testing. Great. Um, I have some um, other questions related to integrations. Um, oh, there's a question uh, from from Bayang. Maybe let's 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 take a look at that. Yeah. Sure. So you you can see that, or should I read it out for you? Yeah. Uh, let, let, yeah. Let's read this aloud for the recording. So uh, I have a question. Uh, given the differences between Cassandra and Scylla, is your effort uh, more towards accommodating all of Cassandra's features? or to make Scylla unique with innovation. And I think you can't uh, ignore either opportunity, right? I mean, obviously if we went our own way and left Cassandra users in the lurch, that would be terrible. You know, we get no migrations from that. So we try and do as much as we can to make Scylla as compatible as possible with, um, with Cassandra. Um, our Scylla migrator, by the way, I said that it could be used to migrate from uh, DynamoDB to Scylla, but you can also use our migrator uh, to do Cassandra to Scylla uh, migrations. And in fact, we have people that they go like, well, I didn't want to tell you, but I'm using your migrator to go from Cassandra to Cassandra. <laughs> so it's a, a nice generalized tool and we, we want to be part of the overall Cassandra ecosystem. 
Uh, obviously, there's some just amazing things. Uh, but let me give you an example. And again, I didn't have this in the uh, slides, but uh, drivers. Because we're a shard per core server design, we have shard aware drivers on the client side. And when you use them beyond just a vanilla off the shelf, non shard aware um, Cassandra driver, we can use all the vanilla drivers. But, um, but if you use the shard aware ones, you can get performance increases of up to like 25%. Just, just the driver alone gives you like a free 25% improvement in speed. And so you're seeing a lot more things like our Go driver, our Rust driver, C++ driver, uh, you know, just, just having all of these um, to be shard aware, Python, uh, that was actually an open source contribution. We got a Python driver um, started up by our customer uh, at Numberly and, uh, and, and they kickstarted and then we said, sure, we, you know, we'll took it, we took it on and then we just, you know, made sure that that thing was tuned really good. Um, there was an open source uh, CRDS Rust driver, but um, it just wasn't being maintained of, um, you know, very actively. And so we made our own Rust driver and, uh, and we shared that. It's based upon the Tokyo framework. Uh, and so with Tokyo underneath it, it's just blazing fast. It's really good. Uh, so, uh, so much faster than just a vanilla uh, um, uh, Cassandra driver. So yeah, even, even there. And then what we do though, is these are not just Scylla drivers. We make sure that these drivers, even though they're faster with Scylla, are backwards compatible and you can use them with a Cassandra deployment, a, just a general Apache Cassandra deployment. There's, we, we make sure that they're not just only for Scylla. We, we make them a community driver as well. So that's an example, you know, and again, I think that the one thing we just want to be careful of, though, is that while we want to cater to the Cassandra audience, we don't want to be limited by only what Cassandra can do today. You know, and I think that you're going to hear some interesting things over the next couple of years, like Raft. This is something we've actually talked about. And um, and I talked about LWTs and, and how those are driven by uh, the Paxos algorithm, for instance. But with Raft uh, as an infrastructure, which... Uh, is now um, part of the um, uh, Scylla 4.5 release vehicle. The underpinnings, the infrastructure for Raft is in there now. It's not functional, it's just the underpinnings, just the guts of it. Um, but what we hope to be able to do then is when that becomes featureized, uh, we wanna be able to allow you to add any number of nodes at a time. Like you don't need to, like right now you need to serially add nodes, one, then rebalance, another, rebalance, right? And that can take, as you saw for Cassandra, more than a day. But can you imagine that you had a three node cluster, you say, I need nine nodes now, boom, you put in the request for that, six more nodes start spinning up and they're all basically uh, using a kind of like a data tablet architecture to just stream up those new nodes and get you up into, um, in into production as quickly as possible. That allows for much faster elasticity, it's not instant elasticity. You still have to rebalance the cluster, but it's going to be a much faster provisioning. Um, and I think that that's the kind of thing that, again, it's just, uh, I'm not seeing anything like that right now in Cassandra. So why limit yourself to what only Cassandra could do? Yeah, so Raft is <clears throat> it's one thing I think Cassandra should start implementing as well. Um, and just so that everybody understand what Raft, Raft is, uh, a more modern, simplified version of how um, you can have distributed systems um, be concurrent using a distributed log. So like etcd is an implementation of Raft, which then powers Kubernetes, for example. Um, and there's all, there are tons of other uh, implementations of Raft. So coming back to the question, um, you know, relating, relating to Raft, um, actually, I'll, I'll come back to a question related to Raft later. I actually wanted to ask a question related to uh, you know integrations with other systems other than Spark. You mentioned Spark, but mm -hmm. um, you you know I think when we were discussing in the past, there's there's integrations with you know Red Panda, which is a Kafka compliant uh, yes. system. Yeah. Um, but what what are some common integrations that people have with Scylla right now that uh, people would expect with Cassandra, but it's been proven with with Scylla. 
Well, I, uh, the, the CDC driver that I talked about, the Debezium based driver, that's available right now from Confluent. Like you can just get that, nice. you know? Um, and so we have a sync uh, and a source connector. Um, so, and again, the source connector making Scylla into a uh, Kafka source, um, uh, that's the more interesting one. That's the one that's using those CDC tables, but just making uh, Cassandra a sync, we've had that uh, far longer and that's also available. So uh, so you basically can go in, your Gazintas and Gazatas all work with, with, with Kafka. You're right that we are in fact cousins with Red Panda, Vectorized Red Panda, because they use the exact same framework underneath what they're doing. But again, if we have the CDC connector for, um, uh, for Kafka, that's the exact same API for Red Panda. So yes, we're immediately immediately available for um, for uh, um, for Red Panda. The more interesting one is Pulsar because, as you guys probably know, the uh, Pulsar um, uh, code comes with a Cassandra connector, like out of the box. Like you just get that for free. It's a gift that you get in inside your Christmas toys, right? Um, batteries included. The issue, and I've been talking with some folks at Stream Native, is that it's not shard aware. Like I talked about those shard aware drivers. So there's a possibility that we could make a shard aware uh, connector for Scylla. And that would just make us zoomier, right? But right now you can still use it out of the box with the same, same exact Cassandra connector. And by general performance characteristics, we should be faster, but this would make us faster, faster. Uh, let's see, I think some of the other things that you start getting into um, some interesting tooling is like if you wanted to do data modeling, um, we're, uh, you can support our schema in Hackalade. So if people are more on the data modeling side, um, that, that tool is compliant with Scylla. If you're into, let's say, the packet sniffing side, uh, we work in Wireshark. That we, we are, you know, our implementation of CQL is actually supported in Wireshark. Um, and then if you're talking about like uh, wider types of integrations, um, OpenNMS uses us as their data collection engine. Uh, so, uh, and they've been very happy with us. They're in fact happier using us uh, rather than Apache Cassandra. Um, I don't think they made any sort of public announcement, but I, I know that they, they really, really like us. And so, you know, you may hear that OpenNMS might standardize on us. Uh, more crazy kinds of utility uh, use cases that you might not have heard of. IOTA is a distributed acyclic graph, not a blockchain, but a distributed yep. ledger technology uh, somewhat yep. related to blockchains. And IOTA chose us as the permanode solution, the underlying uh, gut storage engine underneath what they call IOTA Chronicle in their overall ecosystem. Uh, so that to me is just an incredible kind of uh, 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 showing of what you can do if you had a database that scales to these terabyte to plus to petabyte workloads, millions of operations per second, and you want, you know, you want to have this big fast engine underneath what has been traditionally seen as a kind of a slow boat technology like, you know, um, a distributed ledger, right? It helps change the paradigm. It helps break you out of architectural limits you've had before. So I'm very excited to see how that uh, turns out over the coming year. Um, but yeah, the, the, I mean, there's just, there's, the, and in fact, I'm, I have my radar up all the time. I'm always looking for these and I'm constantly surprised by how people are using us. Um, there are uh, other folks using us in IoT solutions. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of Janus graph implementations that have us as a data store as opposed to uh, HBase or Cassandra or whatever. We just operate faster. So if you like your Janus graph, uh, Gremlin Tinker Pop queries, but you just want to be zippy, boom, you throw Scylla underneath it, and suddenly you're getting a lot better performance on your graph data models. Great. Um, I think <laughs> we're happy. almost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're al we're almost at time. Um, I want one one final question, um, which I don't think you can answer in in a minute. But um, you know, you mentioned graph, and and the other you know common challenge that people have is if if they're putting data in and they need to to search it. So in you know in the Cassandra world, we we find we figure out ways to replicate stuff to Elasticsearch or Solar. Um, you know, leveraging different technologies um, like Spark or Kafka Connect or whatever um, in 
implementations that you've seen of, of Scylla, you know, uh, how are people generally hand, handling the full text workload? Um, and what kind of bridge do they use between Scylla and, uh, and the other index? Well, yeah, I think that that's always a really complex and interesting question. Because first you have your initial data sync, right? Um, and so you could potentially just, you know, use some sort of uh, SS table download, convert to CSV, and then upload that. But then to keep it in sync, I think this is a great possibility for the uh, CDC connector, right? Because then you can just use CDC Kafka to Elastic. Uh, or you could just use, we actually have um, libraries for CDC. I think they're in uh, Java and Go. So those CDC libraries means that you could write your own data pump engine to just consume that CDC and pump that right into Elastic. And you can have, uh, you know, minimum delays. Obviously, it's not going to be instantaneously synced, but you're going to have, you won't have to build like overnight search collection updates, right? You'd be able to get those um, constant intraday you know, what are the dips? What's new? What's new? Uh, and CDC might be a perfect uh, opportunity for that. But it is a non-trivial issue and people do skin that cat different ways. And I'd be very interested in hearing for any opportunities for that because, you know, I'd like to see whether it'd be a good fit. I'd like to see it in the field, you know. Um, but I think that that's what we're steering people to these days is that CDC connector. Got it. Great. Uh, there is one last thing I wanted to share with you guys here, and I am going to put this uh, into the chat for you all. Uh, again, I apologize to anybody who's watching this on demand, but this is a link that I am giving to everybody to get themselves a free t-shirt, courtesy of Scylla. So, um, you know, just make sure that you uh, click on that link before they close the session here so that everybody can get their free monster swag. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Appreciate it. Um, lots of great information and um, definitely a lot, lot to unpack with all the cool features uh, that are obviously mirrored as well as uh, enhancements beyond what, you know, what we see in the, in the mothership of, of, uh, of Cassandra. And uh, def definitely pleasantly surprised with some of the um, community uh, developments in the, in the Scylla world. Uh, so really excited for, for the product and uh, for the larger community. And, thank you. Um, yeah, and, thanks so much. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to thank you guys for giving me this, uh, this time to talk with you all. And I look forward, if you want to invite me back, uh, we can definitely delve more into the Scylla Enterprise features. We can talk about Scylla monitoring stack. Uh, I may be able to invite some friends that actually do the development on these things rather than just hear me. You can hear directly from the engineers themselves. So however we can take this next, just let me know. Awesome, definitely. Well, thanks everybody. Um, we are now at time, so we should uh, wrap up. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks Josh for getting us started. You guys have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week, uh, same time, same place. Take care everybody.